<laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you're here. I don't know if you keep up with the religious news in the world, but uh, it looks like the uh, Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, is splitting up. Uh, there is a conservative group and a more liberal group, and the uh, most of the Anglicans around the world have rejected the Archbishop of Canterbury and his stance on uh, L, P, T, G, Q, M, Z, and Zipper, and all that other stuff. And then the Methodist Church is splitting up for the same reason. Um, but then there was the revival at Asbury University, where college students from around the area there gathered in prayer um, and singing praise to God for about two weeks. So you never know where people are going to walk away from the faith and you never know where people are going to be revived and what we need to do as believers is continue to believe for revival, continue to believe for outreach, continue to believe for bringing more and more people into the family of God. I think about Paul, the Apostle Paul in Corinth where he was there and trembling and in fear and one night the Lord Jesus Christ came to him and said, take courage, Paul. I have many people in this city that need to be called. And that's true everywhere. Um, there are people who are waiting in hope, wanting to know the truth, believe it or not. And we're called to share that truth. You are a love letter from God to somebody. So you need to get delivered. Put a postage stamp on it. All right, take your Bible and go to Acts, not Acts. I'm thinking outreach. Turn to Esther chapter 8. You know, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 6, the devil was tempting Jesus Christ, and he stated that all the kingdoms and power and authority of the world had been delivered to him, and he would give it to Jesus if Jesus Christ would just worship him. In contrast, in Matthew chapter 5, 5, Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So the devil does now own the world and all the kingdoms and power of it. But a day is coming when the people of God, through their union with Jesus Christ, will inherit the earth and all the beauty and all the peace and all the joy that was intended uh, in the beginning back in Genesis. In our story of Esther, Haman is the enemy of God's people, and he does seem to uh, own the world. He has great power and authority and wealth as the second in command to the king of Persia. Um, but Haman's evil ambition all came to an end with his execution, and all his wealth and all his authority was then given to whom? Mordecai was given to Mordecai. And so the same thing will happen to us at the end of this age when Satan and his Antichrist, his future Haman, will be defeated and the meek will inherit the earth. In Esther chapter 8, Mordecai is exalted to take Haman's place of authority. And although Haman is dead, <clears throat> Esther must convince the king to somehow alter his irreversible law about annihilating the Jews. That's still in place. So Esther chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. So this day that is being spoken about is... Uh, the same day that Haman's plot was revealed and that Haman was killed. And on that day, the king gave Esther Haman's estate. There was a Persian law that stated if you accused somebody of a capital crime and it was true <coughs> and they were convicted, you then uh, received all their property in, in, because they were executed. They couldn't hold on to it. So um, Haman was very wealthy. He would have been even more wealthy had he killed and plundered all the Jews. But here his plans were turned against him. And Esther finally uh, revealed her relationship to Mordecai. Now verse 2. 
So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Mordecai is granted the position and the honors that Haman had. All that belonged to Haman now belongs to Mordecai. In this, as I said before, this great transfer, I keep thinking about this, this great transfer will happen to all of us as God's people in when this age is over and the kingdom of God arrives. Our arch enemy, the devil, is currently the ruler of this age, and he grants his power and authority to those who serve him. He works through people like Haman and tries to frustrate and persecute God's people, harass and kill them. But the devil will soon be destroyed. That's promised in Scripture. Romans 16 and verse 20 states that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 tells us that on the day that evil is punished, we will find rest. Let's go there. 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> Chapter 1, all the way into the New Testament. It's like going through a time machine. <laughs> Except we're not going through the stones. <laughs> it's a reference to a TV show, Outlander, where this woman goes through these stones back into ancient Scotland, and then they go back and forth. They get stoned a lot. Go back and forth the stones. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and starting in verse 6 it says since it, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So just like in one day in the future, we're going to gain a rest because evil will be squashed. When we get to the end of Esther, you'll read about peace and gladness and joy and rest. Because evil in that empire had been destroyed when Haman and his forces were destroyed. But I want us to look at the fact that just as all that power was transferred from Haman to Mordecai, that in the future, all the power and wealth of this world will be transferred to the Messiah and to his people. Let's look at Daniel chapter 7. Ezekiel, Daniel, and this is a vision that the prophet had of the Lord Jesus Christ standing before the Ancient of Days, who's God, and receiving from God the kingdoms and power and authority of the whole world. So Daniel 7, and this, this if, if you ever go back and read this, it's right after the uh, little horn, the pompous one, the Antichrist is destroyed. And then the kingdoms are given to Christ. So in verse 13 it says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, if you look at verse 25, not only is this kingdom given to the Messiah, but it's given to his people. Verse 25. And he shall speak, talking about Antichrist, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, for a time and times and a half a time that's talking about the great tribulation to come. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven 
shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all his dominions shall serve and obey him. So what a day that will be when that occurs. You can also read in Revelation chapter 5 where uh, they sing a new song about all the redeemed and how the people that Jesus Christ has redeemed will be kings and priests to their God and they shall reign on the earth. So it's a wonderful, beautiful thing we have to look forward to, even though now there are too many Hamans in the world. Amen. But their destruction is as sure as Hamans, and our exaltation is as sure as Mordecai's. Let's go back to Esther. With the destruction of Haman and the elevation of Mordecai, as I mentioned, Esther still has to deal with that irreversible law of killing all the Jews. So verse 3. Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears to counteract the evil of Haman the Agagite and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther, so Esther arose and stood before the king. And in my mind as I read that, I went, what, what, what? Wait, stop, what? Esther is coming towards the king, and the king would only put forth his scepter if someone was coming that was unsummoned. So, she's with the king in verse 2, but now she's not summoned to be with the king in verse 3. What's going on here? You should know there's time lapse here. About two and a half months or 70 days have taken place between chapter 2 and, I mean, verse 2 and verse 3. Let me show you what I mean. Do we have time? Yes. Yeah, we'll turn the world. Okay. Let's go back to chapter 3 and look at verse 13. Now this is concerning Haman's letter to destroy the Jews. Esther 3.13 And letters were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. So Adar was the 12th month of their calendar. Okay? Everything that happens from 313 all the way to 8, 1, and 2 takes place in Adar that last month. So, now, let's go back to 8, 9. Eight, nine. So the king's scribes were called at that time eight, in the... Eight, huh? 8, 9? Eight, 8, 9. We jumped? We're jumped. Yeah, we're, we're time traveling. Okay? And so the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is in the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded. So, when you look at 3.13 and 8.9, you realize that between verses 2 and 3, 70 days about have passed. That's why Esther, who is not summoned, the king has to hold out the scepter to her to welcome her into the court. So, Esther gets the house of Haman. She gives it to Mordecai. Everybody's happy. They go their own way. They go home. They have tea and cookies. The calendar flips. Calendar flips. Calendar flips. Nothing is done about the law, about the Jews. So Esther realizes something's got to be done. She goes to try to talk to the king. The king has to hold out his, his scepter. He welcomes her into the court. And she pleads now for her people. Now verse 4. And the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, if it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight and the thing seems right to the king and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people? 
or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hands on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews, as you please, in the king's name, and seal it with the king's signet ring, for whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. So, in essence, what the king is saying is, why are you looking at me to do this? You didn't have to wait for me. You've got the signet ring. You write up a law. And that's exactly then what Mordecai does. Verse 9. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horse breeds from swift steeds. By these letters, the king permitted the Jews, who were in every city, to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. On one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan, the citadel. So, at a first reading, it may seem to you that Mordecai's decree was as evil as Haman's. Haman had decreed a holocaust kill every Jew. And it seems what Mordecai's decree is saying is kill everybody, men, women, children, uh, and plunder their goods. But that's not correct. The Jews were just simply given the right to defend themselves. The message was simple. Leave the Jews alone and they will leave you alone. Mordecai's law uh, allowed, did not allow the killing of women and children. It does seem that way in our New King James Version of the Bible, but that's not the best way to translate the Hebrew. Here's the verse, verse 11, from the complete Jewish Bible. The letters said that the king had granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and defend themselves by destroying and killing and exterminating any forces of any people or province that would attack them, their little ones, or their women, or would try to take their possessions. That's the same translation you have in the New International Version. So what's being said is, Chuck, they're coming to get you. You have the right to defend yourself against anybody that wants to hurt Merrily, Michael, and Evelyn and take your house. Get it? It's not that Mordecai is allowing the Jews to attack people and kill little children. He's protecting Jewish little people. And he's only giving them the right, if somebody attacks you, you have the right to defend yourself. Right. So now verse 15. And the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar. Oh, I'm in chapter 9, I'm sorry. Chapter 8, verse 15. So Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. And the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. Do you remember back... In chapter 3, when Haman gave forth his decree to kill all the Jews, 
It says the city of Shushan was very confused and perplexed. Here by Mordecai's statement, the people are glad. I thought about Proverbs 29, verse 2, and, and this is even relevant today. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, they groan. Oh, how we groan today, don't we? We groan. Mm -hmm. A good civil servant is responsible for all of the people under his uh, care. No matter who they are, what their beliefs are, you take care of the people that you serve. Verse 16. The Jews had light and gladness, joy and honor, and in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So, Esther's mission is accomplished. She's found a way to save her people. There is joy in the land. And many people became Jews because they saw the work of God and wanted to be a part of the people of God. And when I read this, this these last two verses, I thought of Acts chapter 2. Because it's similar where people looked at the believers who had joy and fear came upon them and they became believers as well. Let's take a look at that. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, it's one of my favorite sections of scripture concerning how believers should live. Verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So it's a similar situation where when believers, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, when believers live their lives with integrity and faith and love, there are great things that happen. God is able to move and to do great things. And so let's let our light shine. Let's really believe the Bible. Let's love people, let's love God, and let's see what he does, how he brings in people to his family, okay? Amen. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word this morning. I know it's a little confusing with the time warp and all that, but we got through it. Thanks for your goodness to us, and may your word prevail in our hearts, in our lives, and in everything we do for your glory and our good. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.